Uh, our subject today is uh, food authenticity and food service, and we're also going to be looking at the risk and regulation aspects of it. I suspect many people uh, may feel that the horsemeat scandal of 2013 has been done to death across the media spectrum, and that everything in this area has been pretty much sorted out. As we will hear today, while steps have been taken, nothing could be further from the truth. The sheer potential scale and scope of food fraud in the UK. You know, this is potentially a multi-billion pound industry. Head of, uh, head of food crime, a wonderful job title, and I think it's probably the best job title in the civil service, without a shadow of doubt. And it has its advantages too, because my six-year-old daughter went to school a few months back and told her teacher that I was um, head of the food police. And you cannot believe the quality of the school dinner since, <laughs> since you did this. When I was appointed head of the food crime unit in March uh, of last year, I set about defining the remit of the unit a bit sort of in, in, in a sort of a, uh, as brief a way as I possibly could. And this was the definition I came up with. So the key takeaways, if you pardon the pun, from that uh, definition are that it's about dishonesty. This is not about regulatory non-compliance. This is not about um, even sort of uh, um, uh, sometimes uh, uh, reckless behaviour within the food industry. This is about intentional dishonesty. Food fraud generally, generally requires people to make it happen. People to work the production processes, people to be involved in the logistical processes, people to do actually old-fashioned crime, if you like, actually hands-on. Whether they're complicit or knowingly complicit is a different matter, but it requires people. And it's those people that are providing my unit with our very best leads. Uh, and I, how can we incentivize them? What can we do to encourage people to put themselves at risk to come to us? Now, the way it normally works in law enforcement is we pay them. And I, and I have absolutely no uh, ethical problems with that. Um, we don't pay for information. We will pay, if I have my way, for results. The, are we joining up the dots with other police forces, veterinarians um, and other non-food manufacturing retailer ingredient supply type people to feed information, whistle blowing into you? It's about increasing fraud awareness I think with these people. So there are people who are well positioned to find the intelligence we need to do our job, like the veterinarians, like the people who are not, who are perhaps peripheral to the food industry. Um, we need to educate them. That's the challenge that we're struggling with at the moment. We've got the forums, we've got the structures, what we haven't got is the baseline knowledge in those people to know what to look for. Where do you believe the faults in the supply chain were back in 2013 that allowed horse meat to enter the supply chain? I think the food industry was um, generally too trusting, I think would be the short answer to that. Um, I think there, I've often compared it to perhaps the banking industry 50 years ago, where there was perhaps an insufficient recognition uh, that some people could be very, very dishonest. Uh, and I think the banking industry has learned a tremendous amount in that last 50 years, and I think the food industry has too. So to me, it's, it's, a, it's a sense of, um, of, of trust uh, that was perhaps misplaced across the food industry in a sense that it couldn't happen to us. Uh, as Andy said, the, the idea that um, organisations, uh, I think, hadn't been, in a sense, hadn't been challenged, hadn't been tested, um, and didn't recognise the, the, you know, the risk that was there. I'm old enough to remember all the issues associated with intervention beef back in the 1980s and horse meat problems then, so we knew they existed, uh, we took our eyes off the ball and we became too trusting. So I agree in part, um, but I think we became very focused on food safety and fraud was not part of that issue. I was concerned at the time about the lack of joined up thinking about what was coming into this country. So when I asked the question of Andy a moment ago on how we're joining all this up, I found lots of people with a fantastic amount of passion and knowledge who didn't know what to do with the fragments and pub gossip of stuff that they heard going on. We need to make sure that 
all this joins up because as which so clearly demonstrate here just about any product any ingredient is subject to the potential of dilution substitution or adulteration this was food fraud some of you may re remember it back from 1984 known as Spanish toxic oil syndrome where white van man was selling five litre containers of cooking oil around the back streets of Madrid uh, you would hardly believe these days that cooking oil could kill over a thousand people so food safety food fraud has to be taken very seriously because the next serious food fraud issue could be one of these and the licenses that some European abattoirs have to kill multiple species the list is endless from you know um, reindeer to wild boar to emus to horses to pigs to cows to sheep um, you know and, and once you've got that kind of level of protein in your abattoir or deboning plant of course the potential for accidental or intentional uh, cross-contamination can occur but where I went to abattoirs that only and abattoirs and deboning plants that only kill beef um, there is very little chance of introducing a horse because I'd like to think the slaughter man would know the difference between a cow and a horse coming through the layerage I would like to think or a giraffe or a zebra or anything else as a disincentive if people know they're going to court and potentially facing a three million fine, that is a disincentive in itself, I think. If you could change one thing about current regulation that you believe would significantly reduce um, food fraud, what would it be and why? The first thing I'd do is I'd bolster local authority sampling, if you think of that as the prevention arm. I mean, if you think of Nick's model at the bottom of the pyramid, that's hugely in danger at the moment. The big companies will look after this because of issues of reputation. If you go to Mile End Road, where you've got hundreds of chippers, you know, their, their attention to any issues around authenticity, apart from halal maybe, is pretty questionable in terms of sourcing even food hygiene, but local authorities are hugely under-resourced at the moment. A few reflections on what we've heard. I think there's a sense that from Andy that food crime is a, is a relatively new concept and often not perceived as a real crime. Um, we know that resources for enforcement are stretched currently and engagement between industry and regulators can be challenging and there's a real need to encourage more whistleblowing. Any food can be susceptible to food fraud, and any food has the potential to become uh, any fraud has the potential to become a food safety issue. We don't know until we uh, we follow it through, and we don't know what fraud might be next. Um, but I think what we've heard from Tony in particular and from our final panel is that there are ways to mitigate the risk to your business and your supply chain, horizon scanning, food safety management systems, auditing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and uh, I think there's reasons to be optimistic, but still a lot more work to do before we can, uh, before we can say for, for sure that food fraud is, a, uh, is an issue that we've got to grips with. Mm -hmm.